Oh yeah, youth, you, got, you don't have to tell the youth twice. They, like the building's on fire, right? Get out of here. Elementary kids and youth kids, you guys can head out to the side and back to your classes. Everybody else, you are in here with us this morning and we are going to have a morning. So I, uh, I want to keep my little opening comments short because we've got a lot of text to look at today. Uh, a fantastic chapter. If you're visiting with us today, God bless you. Uh, we should be out of here by 1 or 1.30. So don't, I don't want you to worry at all about that. Hey, um, we had a neat time at our first Friday Night Fellowship this past Friday. We had a good group of folks come out. And I just want to encourage you, as we try to keep doing these every month or so, um, to come out when you're able, if you're able, or if and when you're able, um, because it's just a neat time. And um, as you'll start to see on the church calendar, we're trying to kind of create space and, and provide an environment where we can just do more fellowshipping together. Certainly we have times of Bible study and we have those small groups that are happening and the midweek study is about to start rehappening. And um, But we want to really create some time where we can just be together as a church family. Um, so the Friday night fellowships next week, as Susie mentioned, um, as you're leaving, we're going to trap you and stick some ice cream in your hand, and hopefully you'll just stay long enough to eat it with us. Um, remember, we're not meant to do this Christian life alone. It's too difficult to live as a Christian in this world without the support and the encouragement of other believers. And so we really want to work um, as we finish out the summer and kind of head into the fall on creating those connections and strengthening those um, connections that we already have. So we are a family here. Uh, each local body of believers is a family and part of the greater family of Christ. And so we want to be there in support of one another. Along those lines, many of you um, uh, know the Onagas. And so I want to let you know, it's kind of bittersweet, but Ken Onaga finished his race this past week and went to be with the Lord. Um, and so again, we rejoice for him. Imagine what Ken is seeing right now. And if you know Ken, you know how deeply that was the desire of his heart. And of course, we grieve uh, for those who he left behind and for his wife, Carolyn, and for his, uh, his daughters and their families. But um, Again, we want to rejoice with them that we know where Ken is and we know exactly what he's doing. And uh, he is not thinking about us at all. I promise you that. So, um, like I said, we've got a lot of text to look at today. So I just want to pray and really ask the Lord to bless us and to help me move quickly through. I have to confess, I kind of started geeking out a little bit. And you'll see that this morning just in terms of detail and exciting stuff. But... Uh, I'm going to try to get us right through it. So let's pray and just ask the Lord to be with us and to bless. So Father, we do thank you so much for the fellowship that we share, Lord, just united together as your sons and daughters, Lord, brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, Lord. And we thank you for those family relationships that you create for us here within this church family. And so we do pray for the Onagas, Lord, and pray that you'd be with them and comfort them, Lord. And yet we thank you as we think about the legacy that Ken has produced, Lord, and all that he leaves behind, the number of lives that that man touched uh, as he was just so all about the gospel and all about uh, the business of sharing it with those who so desperately need it. So we pray for them, Lord. We pray as well for our time as we go to your word that you would bless it, Lord. Be with us, we pray. We pray that the teaching ministry of your spirit would be manifest here this morning. Teach us, we pray, O Lord, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to be in Revelation chapter 11. If you don't have a Bible, I'm not sure if we're supposed to hand out Bibles, but I'd love you to have one. So if you don't have a Bible or don't want to look at it on your phone or whatever, just raise your hand and one of the guys will get a Bible and bring it to you. But uh, any Bible will do, electronic or, or paper or whatever. So Revelation chapter 11, it's just about all the way to the right hand side of the book. So just keep flipping pages, and eventually you'll get to Revelation, then you'll get to chapter 11, 
And you remember that since back in chapter 6, we've been looking at these first two sets of judgment, which we've talked about happened during probably the first three and a half years of this coming tribulation period, that seven-year period. And so these judgments very likely begin just after the rapture of the church, which kind of kicks off, if you will, the, the tribulation period. In chapter 6, we, we saw that first set of judgments, the seal judgments. You remember in chapters 8 and 9, we looked at the opening of the seventh seal, which then we saw introduced to the next set of seven judgments, the seven trumpets. So again, chronologically, we're at this midpoint now of this seven year long tribulation, right? The, the 70th week, if you will, of the prophecy of Daniel. Last week, remember, we moved into chapter 10 and we started another one of what we've called these parenthetical passages. And in just the same way that you remember chapter 7 kind of paused the action, provided us with a bit more detail, some additional information, specifically about those who would be saved during this tribulation period. And in that very same way, chapters 10 all the way through 14 provide us with some different details all as background to all of these judgments, the seals and the trumpets and the bold judgments, which we'll see finish off everything. And it's information which the Holy Spirit wants us to be aware of, but doesn't necessarily want to disrupt the flow of these events chronologically, and especially not right in the middle of one of these seven sets of coming judgments. And it's these parenthetical passages that really make the book of Revelation difficult to understand unless we understand how they fit, where they fit, and really what they're for. And you remember last week in chapter 10, we looked at what we called the little book with the big message. And we watched basically as heaven assures us that God will on the authority of his word, that he will finish his program. It said, remember that that seventh trumpet was going to bring about the accomplishing of the mystery of God, right? Which isn't really that mysterious, we said. It's really just the fulfillment of all of these many Old Testament passages and prophecies that point ahead to that second coming of Jesus and then the establishing of his kingdom on the earth. And so this morning, as we move closer to that time, we're going to look at chapter 11, which we're going to call Temples, Witnesses, and Woes. And we're going to continue on in this parenthetical section. Now this is a tricky chapter because here we are chronologically right in the middle of the whole book and in this chapter we're going to look both back at the beginning of the tribulation for some detail there but we're also going to look ahead at these events that will specifically kick off the end of all things and because this chapter takes kind of an out of order approach some have referred to this as one of the most difficult in the whole apocalypse. But I think we're going to see there is so much great stuff in this text. It's so important historically and prophetically and, you know, just applicationally, if that's even really a word. But it has great application for us in our lives in terms of personal encouragement and even a little exhortation. And all of that starts off for us in verse 1 of chapter 11. So here's John who writes this. He says, then I was given a reed like a measuring rod. So just think of what we think of as a yardstick, right? Basically, John is handed this yardstick it says, and the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. So here we are, again, midway through this seven-year period. John is simply told, he's given this kind of a weird rod, and he's told to measure the temple that he can see out here in front of him. And specifically to measure three things, the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. Now remember, 
the temple was basically just shaped kind of like a shoebox, at least in terms of its proportions, the actual worshiping part of the temple. A third of it was where the actual altar was, and that was called the Holy of Holies. That's where the high priest could only go one day out of every year on the Day of Atonement. And then the two-thirds that remained, that was the place where the priests would go and minister each day in their worship. That was the holy place. And that's where you can see there the table of showbread and the altar of incense and the golden lampstand. So here John is measuring out these different sections of a Jewish temple. But the question for us is, which temple is he measuring? Well, in short, he's measuring the temple which, according to the scriptures, will be rebuilt and will be functioning again by this point in our timeline. So by three and a half years into the tribulation period, there will be another temple that's been built and is functioning. So John's measuring a temple that has yet to be built. And as we look back to the Old Testament, again, if we're asking, depending on the Old Testament, to help us rightly interpret this New Testament book, we remember Ezekiel, right? Ezekiel chapter 40 through 43, there's this extended, wonderful passage where Ezekiel also measures a temple that is also for a time yet to come. And yet the temple that Ezekiel measures, if you look at the context of that vision, it's the temple of the millennial earth. So during that millennial time, this temple seems to be before that temple. And I think we'll see that as we move through the text. Now, throughout the scriptures, and the history of God's people, the temple has always played such a key role. You remember way back in the book of Exodus, Moses was given this detailed instruction by the Lord for the preparation and the construction of what was called the wilderness tabernacle. It was this tent of meeting, and it was the place where the Lord said that he would meet with his people. It was the place where his divine presence would dwell in their midst. And for nearly 500 years, they used this until King Solomon built the first temple, permanent temple, if you will, there in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah in about 1050 BC. Now, 400 years later, when the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem, they also decimated this temple. And then 70 years after that invasion of Israel by Babylon, Zerubbabel returned from captivity and in 536 BC rebuilt this kind of a, a simple, almost sort of crude looking temple, right? And we would call this the second temple or the Zerubbabel temple. The third temple, was sort of built in 20 BC, and this was Herod's temple. Herod basically enlarged the existing temple in order to win the favor of the Jews, and really more so maybe to build this monument kind of unto himself. This temple, that's the temple that Jesus visited. That's the temple that Jesus predicted in Matthew 24, that because of the rebellion of the Jewish people, that that temple would be completely destroyed. He said that not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. And of course, we shouldn't be surprised that 40 years after his resurrection, that Jesus' prophecy perfectly came to pass. Because in A.D. 70, while they were sacking the city, the Roman soldiers under Titus literally pulled down every stone of this building. Some of those stones weighing 100 tons each, but perfectly fulfilling the prophecy of Jesus to the letter. Now, if you visit Jerusalem today and you visit the Temple Mount, it is a testimony to the words of Jesus because today there is no temple on that temple mount. So when you go up there, and we're going to try to go up there maybe a year or two from now, we'll plan a trip. But when you go up there and you stand up there, you don't see a temple at all. But what you do see is two Muslim mosques. You see the Dome of the Rock Mosque, and you see the al 
Aqsa Mosque, and they are the second and the third holiest sites from all of the religion, religion of Islam. And yet scripturally we know that there is yet this fourth temple that is going to be built there. And that's the one we're looking at here with the Apostle John. And this temple is the one to which the Orthodox Jewish people are looking forward with a great deal of anticipation. Today in Israel, you can visit a place called the Temple Institute. It's right there in the Jewish quarter of the old city of Jerusalem. And there, there are a group of Jews who are absolutely dedicated to this rebuilding of the temple. And they're trying to educate the public and raise awareness for this new temple. Not only that, but they're actually also trying to replicate everything that they can to be prepared for when the new temple is constructed, down to the very specific kind of pots and pans almost that would be used for the sacrifices. And at this point, you can see some of them there in the picture, but the vast majority of all the instruments that they would need to restart the temple sacrifices and the temple worship, according to what's written in the Old Testament, they are all completed and they are all ready. There's another Jewish group called the Temple Mount Faithful, and they're sort of working politically, socially, to kind of promote the reestablishing of the Jewish temple there on the Temple Mount. There are actually two training schools for young rabbis. They're being trained specifically for the priesthood and how to conduct these animal sacrifices in this rebuilt temple. So we see there is this small, strong, highly dedicated group of Orthodox Jews who live to see this come to pass. They want to see a temple because they believe it will fulfill prophecy. And most importantly, it will provide a place for sacrifice once again because the Orthodox Jewish community, they understand what the scriptures make perfectly clear as it says in Hebrews 9, that according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood, and without shedding of blood, there is no remission. No remission for sins without the shedding of blood. And since they don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah, they don't believe that he shed his blood and died for their sins, they realize that they have to make sacrifices for the forgiveness of those sins. So with that in mind, we can easily understand why the rebuilding of this temple is the heart's desire of so many of these Orthodox Jews. Although I have to say, I don't believe that it's necessarily the heart's desire of God himself. Because understand this, because this temple is gonna be built during the tribulation, this is man's temple. This isn't a temple necessarily that God is pleased with. And it's easy for us as Christians and easy for Jews to see all the things that are being prepared and to be excited about that. But really the only thing that the rebuilding of the temple does at all for us as Christians is to help us realize that the end is near. This final temple, God is not pleased with this temple. He didn't command the building of this temple, though he acknowledges it, and we'll see he has a purpose in it. But most importantly, God will not abide in this temple. And in reality, this, a temple, this temple is an affront to God because he's already got another temple, and it's the temple of the Holy Spirit. And this is this temple today that's made, as Peter tells us, it's a temple that's made up today of the living stones of each one of us as the church of Jesus Christ. Peter writes in 1 Peter 2 that you as living stones, that's all of us here, you as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So God's temple today is made up of people who have allowed God to come into our lives by the Holy Spirit because of our faith in Jesus Christ. And there is no better temple, there is no other temple 
than that temple. You think about this temple that's going to be built during the tribulation, and really it's more so an expression of man trying to work his way back to God. Right? By doing certain things and keeping certain laws and keeping certain rituals, all in an effort to establish their own righteousness before God that somehow they can make themselves acceptable. And I'm here to tell you this morning on the authority of the scriptures that that is not how God saves people. He never has and he never will. He saves people by faith in his son and only by faith in his son. And nevertheless, this temple will be rebuilt, and as we'll see, it fulfills some important prophecies. There's one thing, though, that's holding up this key process, and I think we see exactly that in the angel's next instruction to John. He's told to measure this temple, but look what it says in verse 2. The angel says, but leave out the court which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles. And they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. So there was a part of this temple structure that John saw there on the Temple Mount in the city of Jerusalem. Part of it, the angel said specifically, don't measure that, because that's not going to be a part of this temple that's built, but instead that part is going to be under Gentile control. And we wonder, well, why would that be? Well, we sort of alluded to it before, but in the late 600s, a man named Omar built this Muslim shrine, right, atop that 35-acre platform that we call the Temple Mount, and he built it directly over this rock that was believed to have been the site of the original Holy of Holies in the Jewish temple. And it's what we know as today as the Dome of the Rock. And today, as you can see from the picture, it dominates the Temple Mount. It actually dominates the entire panorama of Jerusalem. And so in effect, since that time, right, for over the last 1400 years, the Jews have been prevented from rebuilding their temple on what they think is the original site because certainly the Muslims would never stand for the removal or the destruction of this holy shrine. And what's really interesting is that because when the city of Jerusalem was destroyed in AD 70, the Romans destroyed it so completely that you can't find any evidences of the foundations of the old temple at all. And though most have long assumed that the Dome of the Rock is sitting exactly on the place of that temple, just as recently as 1983, after 16 years of dedicated and exhaustive research on the Temple Mount, there's an archaeologist at the Hebrew University, his name is Dr. Asher Kaufman, and he published these findings. And he actually just added his conclusions to a number of other researchers who'd come before him reaching the same conclusions. And his conclusions were that the true location of the original Holy of Holies, right, that would be the site that would determine the exact placement of this next temple. He believes that the true location is actually 322 feet north of the Dome of the Rock. Now, what's there right now, you might ask? Well, right now, there's just this little gazebo-like structure. There it is. And curiously enough, what the Muslims call this structure, they call this the Dome of the Spirit or the Dome of the Tablets. And it's fascinating to me because it almost would appear that perhaps even they knew back when this was built that this spot was the very spot where the Shekinah glory of God, right, the Spirit of God, where it once hovered over the Ark of the Covenant, which of course contained the Ten Commandments, which sat in the Holy of Holies. So all of this to say that it appears now that the temple itself, which is actually only about 30 feet by 90 feet, the temple itself could be rebuilt 
at its original location and the dome of the rock could remain standing just as it is. And it would end up right in what would be the courtyard of the temple. The very place that John was told not to measure because it had been given to the Gentiles. Now again, I know I'm geeking out a little bit, but isn't it amazing the way that reality always aligns eventually so perfectly with the scriptures? So now we can see how this would be possible, logistically at least, for the Jews to rebuild their temple right on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And all of this, we believe, is very likely going to fall into place politically and diplomatically right during that first half of the tribulation period. Of, again, Daniel's 70th week, when God has removed the church he turns his attention again to dealing with Israel. And you remember back briefly when we started chapter 6. Before we began, we looked at that book of Daniel and that key prophecy. Remember what we called the, the backbone of Bible prophecy in Daniel chapter 9. And what it tells us, according to chapter 9 verse 27, is that the Antichrist, once he has come onto the world stage that he will make a covenant with the nation of Israel for seven years. And yet in the middle of that seven-year covenant or that agreement, he will break the agreement. Now, many people believe that as a part of this treaty, that the Antichrist will actually broker. The Antichrist, again, just this coming world ruler, right? Don't think horns and pitchfork. He's a coming world ruler who's going to come onto the scene. He's going to look like a political savior, but he will actually be able to broker a peace agreement between the Muslims and the Jews, and that that agreement would likely include the rebuilding of their temple on the Temple Mount, right? It's the Jewish dream come true. And what's really fascinating is that if you talk to any Orthodox Jew in Jerusalem today, they will tell you that one of the ways that they will know when their Messiah has come is that he will be the one to finally rebuild their temple. So this is the perfect satanic setup, if you will, because the man that they will initially embrace as their Messiah and will rebuild their temple will in fact be the Antichrist. And we know that their dream is going to be short-lived because just three and a half years, which is coincidentally 42 months, like it mentions here in this passage, 42 months into that seven-year agreement, the Antichrist is going to stop the sacrifices, the temple will be desecrated, it will become a shrine to him as he sets up this idol of himself in the Holy of Holies, proclaims himself to be God, demands that the world worship him as God, and then begins to pour out his fury and his hatred upon the people of Israel. We're going to see that in chapters 13 through 17. We've read about it a little bit in Matthew chapter 24. And of course, for all of this that we've talked about to come to pass, there has to be one more temple built in a time to come. So this is the interesting history. This is the fascinating prophecy concerning the Jewish temple. And the good news is that those two verses only took us, well, just under half of our time together. So now we're going to move ahead. We'll pick up some steam a little bit. We're going to be introduced to I think what are two of the more fascinating and more interesting characters now in the book of Revelation. They have a very unique ministry which we're going to see seems clearly to be connected with this one more temple that John just described and that is the two godly witnesses. So the Lord continues in verse 3 he says and I will give power to my two witnesses and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. So here, 
the Lord reveals to John that he's going to raise up these two witnesses that are going to serve as prophets for 1,260 days. How long do you think that is? It's three and a half years exactly. Most likely that first half of the tribulation period. After this treaty has been signed, as the temple is being rebuilt, and while there are Jews coming doubtless from all around the entire world to come and worship the Lord at this rebuilt temple. And here are these two witnesses as they arrive who are testifying of what? They're testifying of Jesus. They're testifying that Jesus is the true Messiah. They're speaking these things to this Jewish multitude who are coming to this rebuilt temple. And there are many believe that those 144,000 sealed Jews that we saw back in chapter 7, that they will very likely come to faith in Jesus as a result of the testimony of these two witnesses. Think about it. These two men are going to witness for God. They're going to testify of God in the midst of a world that is literally dominated by the devil, right? dominated by the Antichrist, spiritual darkness of that time all around. And yet these two witnesses will have this unique, continual empowering from the Holy Spirit. See there where they're likened to the two olive trees, uh, two, two olive trees and two lampstands. This is just like we find in this beautiful imagery out of the Old Testament in Zechariah chapter four, where we see this image of the two oil of the oil lamps that are filled directly from these two olive trees, right? Where the, the oil just drips from the olives into this bowl and then is piped directly right into the lamps. And what I think is wonderful about this vision is that this was a vision given to Zechariah to encourage Zerubbabel. We just talked about him, right? Encourage Zerubbabel and a priest by the name of Joshua as they were working to rebuild that destroyed temple following the invasion and the captivity of Israel by Babylon 70 years before that. And what happens is the, the men were there standing literally in the ruins of Jerusalem. And they're completely overwhelmed by this task that was ahead of them. They are overwhelmed by this rubble that's all around them. And that was the time when the Lord brought Zechariah, gave this vision, and he promised them that everything would be accomplished not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And the point being that what was about to happen there was going to happen there supernaturally. That they, God is saying to Zerubbabel and he's saying to Joshua, you will finish the rebuilding of this temple because I will give you the supernatural ability to do it by my Holy Spirit. Even though it might look physically impossible, you will be able to do it. And God is taking then this same vision and he's applying it now to these two witnesses who will come. And so in essence, he's saying that by the power of my Holy Spirit, these two witnesses are going to faithfully finish what it is that I'm calling them to do. This overwhelming task, right, that it'll be God who will give them the power to do it. And for these two men, it will be the power to stand alone against the whole world. To be faithful to God and to speak faithfully the things of God. And here no matter what the world throws at them or the devil or hell or the darkness or all of the sin that's around them. All of this intense resistance that's going to come from the Antichrist. That because of the power of the Spirit of God that nothing would be effective in stopping their ministry. And of course, you know where I'm headed with this, right? That it's so wonderful for us to sit back and to realize that the very same spirit that will indwell them to be faithful is the very same spirit who right now, this moment, is indwelling each and every one of us as born-again believers. And that very same spirit who indwells us and empowers us every single day in our walk with the Lord. 
and enables us to be faithful to what it is he's called us to do for him. So I know that there are some of you this morning who seem to be standing in a pile of rubble in your own life this morning. And maybe you're standing there feeling overwhelmed and paralyzed by the thought of trying to rebuild. And for some, maybe it's the rubble of a, a failing marriage. Maybe it's the ruins of a recent loss that you've suffered. Maybe it's the, the continuing rubble of some consequences from some bad decisions that you made. And yet the point is that the Lord says, you will rebuild this. And he says to each and every one of us, you're not going to do it by your own strength. You're going to do it by my strength. He says, you will rebuild this by my strength, piped directly into your life and flowing through your life and out of your life by my Holy Spirit. And he will do it if we just allow him to do it. So we have both of these beautiful images, right? The oil and the lampstands, both of them symbolic of the Holy Spirit's anointing ministry by which these witnesses are going to really shine the light of God's testimony. They're going to be the display of God's power to the unbelieving Jews, to the Gentiles, and there are going to be many who are saved through their testimony. They're going to announce to the world not only the good news of Jesus, but also no doubt these great events that are about to come upon the world. And because of this, they are going to incur the wrath of the beast. And we're going to see, though, they're going to be protected initially, supernaturally, by the power of God. Look at verses 5 and 6. It says that if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. These have power to shut heaven so that of their prophecy, and they have power over waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. I'm not sure about you, but I would not want to get on the wrong side of these two guys. Now, we probably need to ask at this point, who are these two guys? Well, because of the many similar miracles that they perform, these two men are usually identified with Moses and Elijah. Of course, we have Moses, right, turning water to blood and bringing down plagues. Elijah has this connection with, uh, with drought and, and calling fire down from heaven, destroying his enemies. In addition, significantly, of course, we have Moses representing the law, appearing with Elijah, representing the prophets, and those are the two who are seen together with Jesus when? On the Mount of Transfiguration, right there in Matthew chapter 17. Interestingly, in Jude chapter 9, we have this little reference to the fact that Satan and Michael the archangel are in some sort of an argument over the body of Moses. And very likely, some suspect, this may have been Satan's attempt to try to prevent the resurrection of Moses as this witness. Not by accident, of course, we think about the fact that there was no body of Elijah to argue over, right? Because Elijah was supernaturally taken up to heaven in a chariot of fire. So for a number of reasons, the suspicion that they are very likely Moses and Elijah. And really, who better to witness to the Jewish people than the law, Moses, and the prophets, Elijah. Whoever these two men are, they are empowered by the Spirit. Right? And like we said, they're going to shine brightly in the midst of what will literally be the darkest hour in all of human history. Despite what we just read about, there's going to be violent attempts to stop their ministry. Attempts to kill them and to silence them and to stop them from talking about the Lord. And yet every attempt of violence against them is ultimately going to be unsuccessful for three and a half years until, it says in verse 7, now when they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit, so that's the Antichrist we learned in chapter 6, the beast who ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them 
overcome them and kill them. Now, we know that sinful men have never wanted to hear the word of God. They don't want to obey the word of God. And these two witnesses are going to be divinely protected to proclaim the word of God until their work is finished, at which point God is going to allow the beast or the Antichrist to oppose them and to slay them. But what's important to notice here is that this is not going to happen according to the Antichrist's terms. Right? The only reason that the Antichrist is able to then overcome them is because their ministry has been completed. Notice that Satan, right, and working through the Antichrist, he has no power against them until they finally finish their testimony. And again, that is a wonderful thing for us to realize that the very same thing is true about our own lives. You know, as we're walking with God and as we're serving God, we can be confident that he alone is the one who numbers our days. He alone is the one who determines how long we're going to be on this earth. Tragedy doesn't determine it. Illness doesn't determine it. Even cancer does not determine that. God is going to do whatever is necessary for us to remain alive until we finish everything that he has called us to do. And then, when we have finally finished our testimonies, God, right, knowing how beautiful heaven is and how wonderful it is and how peaceful it is, and because he is the loving God that he is, when our ministry here is complete, he knows there's no sense in leaving us here any longer, and he simply takes us home. And he does it not a moment too soon and not a moment too late. And when he does it, he says to us, well done, good and faithful servant. Right? Enter into the joy of the Lord. So we have these two witnesses who had witnessed well and they had witnessed faithfully. And yet we're going to see that the Lord had even one more thing that he was going to do through both of these men. Notice the extraordinary events in this next verses 8 through 12. Notice what happens surrounding the death of these two men. Just verse 8 to start with. It says, And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. So it says here that even after these men are killed, their bodies are going to be left there on the street, unburied in Jerusalem, right? Of course, that's the city where Jesus was killed. This is part of why we know they're ministering here in connection with the city of Jerusalem, with the temple. The Lord refers to that whole city here as what? Sodom, which means vice, right? Speaking of immorality and Egypt. One translation of Egypt is vanity, right? Speaking of idolatry because of the people's apostasy and their rejection against God. So Jerusalem, which means the city of peace, has now turned into the city of wickedness and the city of idolatry. And it's so tragic, I think, for us to realize that the very city which Jesus wept over is going to become the seat of sin in the final days of human history. It says in verse 9 that then those from the peoples, tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days and not allow their dead bodies to be put into graves. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry, and send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. So not only will those there in Jerusalem not even give them a proper burial, right, for three and a half days, but the whole world, right, peoples, tribes, tongues, nations in verse 9, they're going to gloat over these dead bodies and the fact that their convicting words have been silenced. Now here's just something interesting to consider from this text of course, that was written nearly 2,000 years ago. At the time of John's writing, 
how would this possibly have ever been accomplished? How would the whole world see their dead bodies? And of course they wouldn't. No doubt the news of what had happened, it would travel to the surrounding areas, but there is no way that their bodies would have been seen by the people's tribes, tongues, and nations, right? Clearly a reference to the population of the planet. There's no way that that would have happened, at least not until within the last 100 years with the invention of the television. And more specifically, probably within the last 40 or 50 years until satellite broadcasting. Right until the major networks and then the CNNs and the MSNBCs and the Fox News, right? These 24 hour news networks, these services, now we can watch a war in real time right as it happens, almost like a sporting event. And the, in a sense, this is kind of exciting because it is just another indication that we are living in a time when these amazing prophecies not only will, but they could be fulfilled, right? Scripturally and technologically. And so the picture here is that watched on TV by the entire world, that the death of these witnesses is gonna be considered a tremendous victory for the Antichrist, right? This popular world ruler, as well as for Satan, who empowers him. And then they were gonna have this three and a half days. It's almost gonna be like a satanic Christmas celebration, right? People are gonna be, doesn't it say, hosting parties and exchanging gifts and rejoicing that their tormentors are dead, right? These two men who tormented the world with what? Tormented them with the word of God. Tormented them with the holy lives that they live. And isn't it interesting to consider that the world will be so wicked that simply the word of God and a holy life will be considered a torment to those who dwell in it. That's what the Bible says is coming. That time when good will be called evil and evil will be called good. Everything will be completely upside down and backwards during the tribulation. And we are watching that begin to build right now in our day. Who would have dreamed that we would be witnessing an attack like we're witnessing on the law of God and on the Ten Commandments of God, on the, the idea of a righteous standard that might come from God world, God's word, the kind of attacks that we're seeing on the Bible, and yet it is a torment. Right? The Ten Commandments are a torment. The fact that there is a God-given right or wrong is a torment to a certain kind of worldly person who is already living in the world today. And so we can only imagine as we fast forward, who knows how many years, at the point that the church has been removed from the scene, the way that the preaching of these two witnesses and their call to repentance, we can imagine the way that will be a torment for so many because they cannot stand to hear the truth because they want to love instead the lie of the sinful lives that they're living. And so here the world's gonna rejoice in the power and the victory of the beast that he was finally able to silence these offensive voices until we get to verse 11. Verse 11 says that after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here, and they ascended to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies saw them. Can you imagine? Right, didn't I promise you the Lord had just one more thing he wanted to do through these two witnesses? Imagine the scene here. Right, you've got the network news cameras still rolling, no doubt, and after three and a half days dead in the street, suddenly these two witnesses are going to be resurrected. Think about the fear all around the world 
that's going to come as people see these two men who they, whose deaths they've been celebrating, they're going to see these two men come back to life on the streets of Jerusalem. And then to see them called and caught up into heaven as their enemies stand there stupefied, right? Dumbfounded. I'm not even sure what more we need to say about that, right? Now, I know that these guys are kind of mysterious in like an Old Testament sackclothy prophetic kind of a way, but I really love these two guys. And they really, really minister to me because I think that as we today look at the example of the two witnesses, there are times when we can sometimes each feel in our own individual witness like we might be one of these two guys, right? Well, maybe it's not actually Moses with Elijah. Maybe it's me with Elijah, right? Maybe I'm the guy. Because we can feel beaten down and rejected and driven out. We can feel silenced. And in a much less significant way, obviously, we can feel persecuted by the very people that we're trying to minister to. Right? People seem to rejoice in our hardship and sort of leave us laying there near death. And sometimes we can get to that point where we wonder how we can possibly continue facing this kind of rejection or maybe even hostility or how we can continue to be misunderstood and mistreated the way that we are. And we think that we can't last another day, but then we remember they lasted 1,260 days. How? By the empowering of the Holy Spirit. Right? They are supported and sustained and directed and energized and protected by God all the way until their testimony is complete. So the question is, is your testimony complete? Well, you're sitting here, so apparently not yet. Is mine complete? Apparently it's not quite done yet. You can imagine this is a reality that's hitting me close to home right about now. And the point is that as long as God is not finished with us, he will continue to affect us and he'll continue to direct us and he will continue to protect us and we will continue, not by might nor by power, but by his spirit. And we'll do it each and every day until we've completed our testimony and we too are caught up into heaven to be with him just like the two witnesses. Right after which, right, right after the two witnesses, we're going to see next there's this judgment that comes upon the city that so badly mistreated them. In verse 13 it says that in the same hour, so right when this happened, there was a great earthquake and a tenth of the city fell. In the earthquake, 7,000 men were killed, and the rest were afraid and gave glory to the God of heaven. So once God's servants are safely out of the way, God pours out his judgment on his own city that just rejected his final witnesses. Right? There's this tremendous earthquake that's going to destroy a tenth of the city and kill 7,000 people. And here, just unlike all the other judgments... At least this point, the, the survivors, it says, are terrified and they give glory to the God of heaven. Now, unfortunately, what we don't see in the remaining verses of the chapter, we don't see that there was any evidence of a real repentance. And in fact, what we see is, is instead the opposite. What we see is that the, this final act of rejection here at this point of the tribulation, this is going to be kind of the inciting incident of what brings on the beginning of the end. In the final verses of this chapter, what we now have is kind of a summary of the rest of the action of the book. So after this one more temple, after these two godly witnesses, we have the third woe. Verses 14 through 19, we're going to take them mostly all together. Verse 14 says, the second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. 
And the 24 elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who is uh, and the one who is and who was and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and reigned. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth." Now, you'll be glad to know we're not going to spend a lot of time on these verses now because no doubt we're going to spend a lot of time on these verses later when we see these events actually unfold in the coming chapters. But this is so big because we've been waiting since chapter 8 for this third woe that was promised. We were assured, weren't we, in chapter 10 that the seventh trumpet would bring about the accomplishment of this mystery of God, right? The fulfillment of all of these Old Testament passages about the second coming of Christ. And here it is, right? It's a prophetic preview, again, of that promise. And then there's this cry in heaven, basically rejoicing over the fact that the earth is about to come under new management. Right? No longer is it going to be ruled by sinful man. It's not going to be dominated by sin and rebellion of man against God. All of that is going to be brought to an end as Jesus rules and reigns in absolute righteousness. So we have this seventh angel sounding the trumpet. We have these great voices from heaven. Notice what they announce, that the kingdoms of this world are finally in Christ's power. Now we're going to see that Jesus doesn't actually take control of the world until after his second coming in chapter 19. So at this point, this is a declaration of events to come. It does help us understand chronologically that the return of Jesus immediately follows all of this period of judgment. And there's this mighty chorus in heaven that joins in the... Look at the verses one more time quickly. Notice the way the prophecy of verse 15 is followed by the praise of verses 17 and 18. We've got these elders that are glorifying Jesus specifically for his power, right? That he's the almighty one. He is the only one who can stop the insanity of what this world is apart from God. The only one who can turn this upside down world right side up. And, it, you know, we're getting worse and worse, aren't we, by the day. Did you notice that these elders, this is the third time we've seen the elders fall on their faces, isn't it? This is the third of these heavenly praises. Remember in chapter 4, they praised him because he was the creator. Chapter 5, they praised him because he was the redeemer. And here they praise him because he's the king. And I point this out because hopefully we remember who specifically it is who's represented by those 24 elders. Do you remember who it is? It's us, isn't it? It's the church. And of course it should go without saying, but I'll say it anyway, that we should be praising him in just the same way. And we should be doing it always and all the time. But we only can do that when we look at things from a heavenly perspective and not from an earthly one. Again, notice that these voices and the elders, they're praising God from heaven for something that had yet to come and yet they're praising him as though it had already happened. Now, again, grammar nerds, in the ancient Greek, the verb tense indicates this absolute certainty about the fact that Jesus is coming again. And it's an absolute certainty even before it actually occurred. And my point is not to get caught up in Greek grammar, but my point is just to remind us one more time that what God has purposed and what he has promised that he will accomplish. And so often we look at things from our earthly perspective and we let all of the circumstances cloud our judgment, right? We see the barriers that are standing in the way of God fulfilling his promises, 
But what God sees is he sees the promises already fulfilled in spite of those same barriers. So we can and we should be rejoicing with the elders even in heaven right now that God can and he will and he has fulfilled all of these wonderful promises to us. Now as we finish up with our very last verse, we remember the way that the, the chapter began with the temple on earth. That was the creation of man. Now it's going to close with the view of the true temple in heaven, the dwelling place of God. Look at verse 19. It says, Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. And there were thunderings, noises, uh, lightnings, pardon me, noises, thunderings, an earthquake, and great hail. So again, all these evidences of this storm that's coming, right? Lightnings and thunderings and noises. And what's so interesting, I think, about this last verse is here in this New Testament book, Right? Our attention is focused here on the Ark of God, which, of course, is an Old Testament symbol of God's presence with his people. Remember, we said that in the Old Testament tabernacle and in the temple that the Ark stood behind the veil in the Holy of Holies. We've talked before about the fact that God's glory rested upon the Ark. Of course, God's law, the two tablets, were within the Ark which is a, a wonderful illustration that you can never separate the two. He's a holy God that has to deal righteously with our sin, but he's also a faithful God who keeps his promises to his people. And this gathering storm now that John sees around the ark, it's an indication that God is about to fulfill all of those holy, righteous promises of his law. Right? The greatest judgment of all is about to fall on the rebellious people of the earth. You remember at Sinai, when the law was first given, there were thunderings and lightnings. And now the, the thunderings are given again as God is about to judge the world for breaking his law. Right? So God will ultimately take his law, right? the righteous standard of his law, the perfect holiness of his law and he is going to bring to bear that law upon the earth and anytime you have God's righteous law coming into contact with the sin and the rebellion of man what does it equal it equals judgment and that's precisely what's coming so we can look around today and we can be so discouraged as people try to remove God's holy righteous standard trying to remove it from public life, trying to take it out of their private lives. But the, in the end, the law will come to bear in the life of each and every individual. But what a blessing, I think, as we close for us to remember. As God's people, we don't need to fear this coming storm. Right? We don't need to fear this coming judgment. Why? because Jesus already took it on our behalf. And this picture of the ark should remind us as his children, not only of his presence and not only of his faithfulness, not only of his promises, but this picture of the ark most of all should remind us of his mercy. Because as you know, right, you students of the scriptures, right? Atop the Ark of the Covenant, right, always covering over the two tablets of the law inside, was what? It was the mercy seat. The mercy seat, which is a beautiful picture of Jesus and his work on the cross, which completely covers over all of our transgressions against the holy law of God. And all that's required in order to have that happen in our lives is to receive him, to receive him in his sacrifice by faith in him. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word, Lord. Uh, we thank you for the encouragement that it brings, Lord, for the detail that it provides. Lord, I thank you for the patience of everyone here. 
as we got through, um, Lord, such a lot of information. But I pray, Lord, that you would help just to write these truths on our hearts. Lord, help us to, to take away what you want us to take away um, with us today. And so we thank you, Lord. We praise you. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.